Our desire is to surrender all to you. Our desire is to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls, with all of our strength. We want that. We want you. Lord, would you be honored through our living and keep correcting us until you are more honored through our living? Anybody want that? Anybody want the Lord to keep, to keep nudging you along so that he gets glory from your life? Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. And Lord, prophetically, there are several things on the table for this church. Things that you are challenging us. Things that you've been challenging us. I pray that somehow, Father, those things would be delivered in great love. And that your people would be wonderfully exhorted to do what you said. Forgive us for those times, Master, where we have clearly heard your word, read your word, understood your word, and then rejected your word. We can't walk in the anointing like that. Forgive us, forgive us, Master, for just allowing all the worldly entertainments and temptations to just overrun our biblical sensibilities. Forgive us, Master, for being, knowing that we're not supposed to be of the world, but being in it, uh, while being in it. But Father, forgive us for being in it and sometimes liking being in it. There are some things that you want to say to this ministry, some things that you, you want to help us with. As the, as the preacher prayed this morning, Lord, would you open up the hearts and minds of your people? He who has an ear, let him hear. May you open us and give us listening ears. Not to just today, but this next stretch is important for our church. Help us to hear you. And then, let's go beyond the hearing. Lord, help us to move beyond the hearing and into the doing. Give us your wisdom in Jesus' name. We love you so much. In Jesus' name. God's people say it. Amen. We want to go to the book of James, the Lord's brother. We've been working our way for three weeks. We worked our way through this grace of joy that we've been given today. We want to take another step and, and talk about the assurance of wisdom. James chapter one, verses five through eight. James chapter one, verses five through eight. We're going to walk a little bit in that. Hopefully a blessing to you today. And then we have the Lord's table to celebrate uh, at the end of uh, service today. So I'm going to read the scripture. I do have a couple of exhortations and then we'll get into the word, but I'll read the scripture so you can sit down. And then just a couple of quick, quick exhortations and then we'll get into the, the word today. The assurance of wisdom. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. The Bible says, If any of you lacks wisdom, how many of you have ever been in the any of you category before? How many of you are in the any of you category like right now? Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, me too, me too. Because there's always places where we need wisdom. Okay, all right. So we're all, okay, all right. So if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in what? Faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything. Wow. Wow. Let me, once, verse 6 again, let him ask in faith for no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable. James, James, unstable. Not in some, but in all his ways. Father, in Jesus' name, help. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody say family worship. Just an exhortation we haven't talked about in a while. Please keep going. Please, please don't stop. 
I know it's hard. I know it gets a little, you know, mix it up a little bit. Do, you know, go to the zoo and do it or something. Or, you know, go, go have some fun. But, but at, please don't stop. Are your children worth it? Yes. They are. Please don't stop. Those of you who have the honor and privilege to uh, be discipling your grown children, that's good too. Stay in there with them. Hang in there with them. Keep on rolling. Keep on going. Keep singing songs of praise in your home. Keep reading the Bible in your home. You men, brothers, where are you, brothers? That was, I don't know, what was that? Ooh, ooh. come on, bro. <laughs> brothers, where are you, brother? Okay, you're in charge if you're there, okay? And we make no apologies for that if, if, in our church. So uh, that means it's your responsibility to make sure this comes off. So, man, I really want you to dig in there and, uh, and make sure you're leading your family to God, uh, continuing his commandments and his, his love in the house and preaching his word in the home and giving your children the gospel over and over and over again because they need it over and over and over again. And so I just want to encourage you there to keep on going. Don't stop now. Don't get weary in well-doing. James chapter 1 is where we are. James chapter 1, talking today about the assurance of wisdom. The assurance of wisdom, which means that what I'm trying to say there by the title is that if we ask, God will actually give it. We can be assured based on the text of Scripture that if we ask God for wisdom, God will give us wisdom. Doesn't that sound good so far? Okay, and how many, one more time, how many of you need a little wisdom? Man, there's some things right now where I definitely need, what is wisdom? Wisdom is, is, is the right application of, of divine knowledge, right? Of right application of knowledge. And, uh, and so we, we need that. We need to be able to do what God says, when God says, how God says. Uh, because we want him to be pleased with our living. And so we're going to deal today with the assurance of wisdom. Now, you might recall that when we started James just a few weeks ago, here's what we said about Brother James in this, this epistle. Often called the Proverbs of the New Testament, the book of James practically and faithfully reminds Christians how to live. From perseverance to true faith, as we heard in prayer this morning, to controlling one's tongue. Submitting to God's will and having patience, all of these key things are wrapped up in James. This book aids readers in living authentically. Someone say authentically. Authentically and wisely for Christ. Reading James is like reading the New Testament Proverbs. It really feels like that because there's wisdom coming. Boom, 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 boom. And, and, and it's, just, it's just absolutely amazing. So I'm really hoping that we come out of James a wiser and more obedient church, even during times of trial and even during times of temptation and suffering, which, by the way, is the context or the background of the epistle of James. The next bullet says, James is a book of of New Testament wisdom. James is a book of New Testament wisdom. To understand James and his exhortations in this epistle, it must be understood again, as I've said, that he was writing to believers in severe trial and temptation. To understand what he's really driving at, you almost have to kind of transport yourself a little bit and realize that his hearers weren't having such a great time. His hearers, as we've said, week one, were under some form of persecution. His, ear, his hearers were, were being pressed because they were Christians. I don't know if y'all have seen the news recently, but we live in a day where Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, are being pressed because they're Christians. And the, I don't know, the, it's something in me that continually asks myself the question, Lord, what would we do here in the West if that kind of persecution came? If all of a sudden, you and I we're subject to arrest. If all of a sudden maybe we feared for our children's safety because they named the name of Christ. We're so insulated here. We think that it can never happen here. And I'm not trying to sound alarmist. I don't know what the next 50 years will hold. I don't know if the Lord will return in that time. But literally right around the globe, our brothers and sisters are being persecuted and martyred for naming the name of Christ. How many of you know we need a little wisdom? I wonder what, if you'll just excuse, I wonder what would happen if the, if the American church, with all of her money, 
and with all of her power and with all of her influence wasn't rocked so easily by the smallest of things, but we could actually do what thus says the Lord, not just down the street, but around the world. Who should be leading this global charge for Christ right now? Well, it should be us, but frankly, there are, there are people in other places praying for us over here because we've gotten so weak in our faith. There are people in persecuted countries saying, Lord, wake up the church in America. Oh, Lord, don't let it be for them about another car or another house. Help them live not just for a time but for eternity. Lord, they can shake the world if they ever decided to obey you in power. Oh, God. And they're, they're crying out for us even as we speak. It's been said now for a decade that, that Africans and Asians are sending missionaries here to shake up the lazy American church who can't seem to say amen unless somebody says something about a blessing. We need wisdom and we need to understand the milieu or the context of what James is exhorting because he's talking to people going through. Okay? We could really say in context that when you're going through, read James. So at least you know how to be wise in the midst of your suffering. I love Matthew Henry. If you've never read Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry lived a couple hundred years ago and is a great preacher and, and has this wonderful set of very, very popular commentaries. And, uh, and I checked them from time to time. And I was just struck by his opening words uh, as it relates to James chapter 1, so much so that I put it in here for us. He writes, Matthew Henry writes, the suffering state of Christians in this world is represented, and that in a very instructive manner. If we attend to what is plainly and necessarily implied together with what is fully expressed. Number one, it is, and again, he's commenting on James chapter one, it is implied that troubles and afflictions, listen, may be the lot of the best Christians. How different is that than what we've learned in the American church for the last 30 or 40 years. We've learned that the, the more we do and the better we do and the more we shout and the more we proclaim and the more we sow, our stuff is going to work out. James is implying the better you go, the harder you go, that might actually mean more suffering for you. It is implied that troubles and afflictions... Oh, by the way, let me stop right there. How many of you know that's true? That is true. I can tell you, I, you know, I, I can preach that from the Bible. I can also tell you now from personal experience, because the last couple of years have taught me that the harder you go at the Word of God, doesn't necessarily mean that folk going to jump up and spin around and say amen. I have learned that now from personal. I mean, I can, yes, that's in the Word, and yes, we see all the apostles, and yeah, but I can tell you now just from spurts. I can tell you from spurts that everybody ain't into sola scriptura. Some folk want sola, I'm going to do what I want when I want to. Don't say nothing, I don't like tura. So yeah, that's, that's the way that is. That's the way that is. But listen, it is implied that troubles and afflictions may be the lot of the best of Christians, even of those who have the most reason to think and hope well of themselves. In other words, they're doing great in the Lord. Why am I going through all this? Doesn't mean you're not blessed. Doesn't mean God's blessings may be defined a little different than your blessings. Blessed are you when you are persecuted and endure all manner of wickedness for my name's sake. And I, you know, so what we need to do is kind of realign with him, not trying to get him to realign with us, such as have a title to the greatest joy, may yet endure very grievous afflictions as good people are liable to be scattered. They must not think it strange if they meet with trouble. Again, this is in the context of counting everything joy. Listen, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm obeying God. I'm doing what, listen, get free here. I'm obeying God. I'm doing what God says. I'm trying to lead my family, Bishop. I'm doing, doing Why do I keep walking through this? Why me? My brother, my sister, why not you? If, if anything, based upon your strength, you are the first one to, 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 to in line for this kind of privilege. You can be, you then model for the rest of us who are so strong what it, what it means to walk in the midst of trial 
and still hold your integrity and uplift the name of Jesus. In other words, your Lord and my Lord walked through it. All of his disciples walked through it. All of his apostles walked through it, yet we want the exemption notice. James is saying, be wise in the midst of all of these things that are going, nothing, nothing here. Peter said, look, some of these things that, don't think it's strange when some of these things come upon you. Look, these things happen to our Lord. Do you really want to follow Jesus? Let me see your hands. Anybody really want to follow Jesus? Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, he must take up his sectional sofa and big screen. (laughs) Oh, Christian, listen, Christian, listen. I know this isn't very popular teaching, and I know that it's different from what almost anyone else is saying. But listen, gird up your loins. Christian, hear me. I love you. Hear me. For the time is coming and now is where the people of God are going to have to figure out whether or not they're going to be the people of God. We are being pushed in this nation away from righteousness like never before. We have lost our prophetic voice. We are scared to death of offending anyone about anything, even when it's the word of our God. We better figure it out, and we better figure out that this is nothing new, that when the saints of God stand for what God God has called them to to stand for, that suffering many times can be the result. The question is not whether or not we're going to suffer. The question in in our context today is how wise are we going to be when the suffering comes? How wise are we going to be when the suffering comes? Look at number two. These outward afflictions and troubles are temptations to them. The devil endeavors by sufferings and crosses to draw men to sin and to deter them from duty. Somebody say amen to Matthew Henry. Preach, Brother Henry. Or unfit them for it. But as our afflictions are in God's hand, they are intended for the trial and improvement of our graces. In other words, what are some of these graces? Well, one of them was joy. One today is wisdom. We'll see some more as we go through, right? But our graces are supposed to improve by our trials. That's why we can count it joy. The gold is put into the furnace that it may be purified. Anybody ever pray, pray, purify me, little Lord, make me pure before. That's, that's when you start getting King Jamesy in your prayers. Before thee. Lord, helpeth me. Well, that, what, what are we asking? Okay, then I'm going to get the impurities out of you. You prayed to be pure, but you have impurities. Therefore, I have a process of taking care of impurities. <gasps> Till it's all, we just want God to take it away. Lord, I'm, I'm lustful. Just take it. <laughs> Thank God for his grace. Maybe he does that sometimes, but sometimes you're going to go, right, okay, then I'm going to confront you with every lustful thing known to man and make you cry out to me. I'm going to allow the devil to do it, and then I'm going to ask you to cry out to me in the midst of it, and we're going to root the impurity right out of you. It's kind of like declaring a fast, and then you start seeing all these food commercials. Number three, these temptations may be numerous and various, diverse temptations, as the apostle speaks in King James there. Our trials may be of many and different kinds, and therefore we have need to put on the whole armor of God. Hallelujah. We must be armed on every side because temptations lie. Where? How? When? On every side. Don't you think for a moment that you're going to wade into family reformation or church reformation or, or try to hold to Scripture and so forth and not deal with temptations on every side. Don't you, don't, don't be that naive about the way things are in the spirit world. Don't say, I'm, don't think I'm going to be a great husband and not have to face battle after battle with that declaration. Don't you think, I'm going to disciple my children. Well, then the war is now on. You better get prepared for that because the devil says, no, you can't have them. They're mine. And you said, no, they belong to God. So there's a conflict that occurs. Don't think that you're going to try to be pure in an impure world. Not just an impure world, but a world that is celebrating wickedness. Oh, gosh. 
Does it bother anyone in the room? Oh, we need to preach it. We need to get we, we need to get our prophetic voice back, y'all. Really, the church is not only the church seems to be participating, clapping at darkness. We ought to be the one going, look, we love you, but this is wrong. Thus says the Lord. Boom, boom, boom. Thus says the Lord. Boom, boom, boom. In other words, what are we here for? Please don't tell me it's for barbecues. We need wisdom to endure the suffering that comes when we stand on the word of God. Listen, friend. (laughs) You will endure suffering for standing on the word of God. You may get away from it for a minute, but it's coming. And you're going to say in that day, goodness, I just, I just, I just did what it said. Why y'all so mad? It's coming. Okay. Number four, the trials of a good man are such as he does not create to himself nor sinfully pull upon himself, but they are such as he said, he is said to fall into. And for this reason, they are better born by him. In other words, you didn't do it on purpose. The, The trial came to you because you were walking in righteousness. Therefore, you can, you can handle it. Here's how. One, you're going to count it joy. Two, today we're going to find out. We're going to walk in wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. Amen. Amen. So the core of our text today is the need for God's wisdom in times of suffering, temptation, and trial. Matthew Henry goes on to say, the graces and duties of a, of a state of trial and affliction are here pointed out to us. We, uh, could we attend to these things and grow in them as we should do? How good would it be for us to be afflicted? In other words, if we could grow in joy and grow in wisdom because of affliction, how great would it be to be afflicted? The truth of the matter is, friends, we learn the most during times of trial. The truth of the matter, and here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the sad state of America. We are not going to do anything big until we absolutely have to. That's the way we are. We're not going to move on the debt until everything's about to collapse. We're not going to move. The church isn't going to move on immorality until people start, until people start marrying, you know, three and four people married. Because we, we, we just let the two men, two women thing in Virginia just get right by. My whole, whole bunch of folk mad that we're even talking about it. Just leave it alone. It's all right. No, it's not. Ain't nothing right about it. It's just, it was wrong in the, is it wrong in the Old Testament? Is it wrong in the New Testament? Why? Because it's wrong in the heart of God. For in the beginning, he made them male and female. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. And you need to be able to call it wrong. I mean, if we can't even get you to call it wrong, battle's over. At least for now, right? So listen, friends. How great would it be for us to be afflicted then if it means that in these graces we'll grow? That's what Matthew Henry is saying. Now, we found out at our church the last few weeks that one of these graces during affliction was joy. Somebody shout joy. We we preached on it for three weeks. We can have joy in the middle of it all because it's not based on it all. It's based in him. How are y'all glad about that? We found out joy is available to you now, not based upon your goodness or the world's goodness, but based upon the goodness of God. God. We found out that joy is a heritage of the Christian. It it enters into the heart of every new believer and is cultivated over a life of prayer and worship and obedience. And eventually, the reason why it can remain so joyful in the midst of suffering is because it points us to a place where there is no suffering. We're going somewhere with all of this. Well, the grace today that we're going to work on is wisdom. The inference in James text today is another grace that we should walk in during difficult times. Your blank again is wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. One more time on the text. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask how in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You know what? Every time I read that, I'm just, I, I stick to myself. I want the wisdom. I don't want the double-mindedness. I, I, I really do want the wisdom. I don't want the flakiness of doubt. 
where I am, where I'm tossed, like, listen to the language, tossed like the wave of a sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Who, who wants to live like that? Always up, always down, always in, always out. Don't know what to think, thinking this one day, thinking this the next day. Okay, I'm going to do this. Okay, I'm not going to do this. Okay, I'm going to do this. Okay, I'm not going to. Okay, I know the Lord's word said this. Mm, I don't know if that's what the Lord's word said. Okay, I know the Lord's word said. Mm, I don't know if that's what the Lord. And so you end up in this little, I don't know, this little flaky living scenario that God calls double-mindedness. And then warns us that we're not to even expect him to answer this prayer for wisdom if we're going to roll like that. The inference in is that some of this is up to us. That he's there to help us, he's going to help us, but you're going to have to put your mind to it. In other words, you're going to have to decide to be obedient. Okay? And so, let's think about this as we walk through this passage. Number one. When do you and I make some of our worst decisions? I submit to you that we make some really bad decisions when times are bad. We also make some really bad decisions when times are good. In other words, at the two extremes of life is when we make our worst decisions. Making decisions during times, bad decisions during times of suffering is pretty self-explanatory. But wait a minute, Bishop. You mean tell me we make bad decisions when times are good? Uh Uh-huh. Because we think they can never go bad again. Look look at the nation. When when, when we were, (laughs) case in point, not that we're anything, but I just remember this because we lived it. But I remember in 2004, 2005, uh, when when we were teaching, we were, at the time, I was able to go places and teach on getting debt-free and so forth. And and people were not hearing me. Money was easy. Banks was just throwing money at people. Y'all remember the go-go mid-2000s? Well, you can get a loan for breathing. You can walk in, hey, my name is such and such. I ain't got no job. I ain't got no money. Can I get a loan? Sure, we got low interest rates and blah, 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 blah. We can put you on a balloon. And folks was not here. I mean, it was like, it was like that cute preacher, your little biblical principles. That's, that's, that's nice. That's just not the way the world works. It's very, you, you learn a little more. Come back to me. We'll talk. I remember very, I mean, because this was where I was living this. So I remember, I was like, no, that we got to hold to the script, blah, blah, blah. And then the thing crashed. And a whole bunch of folks who made bad choices when times were good. So we tend, so, so at either extreme, we can make bad decisions when times are good and bad decisions when times are bad. And that's the nature, nature of temptation and trial. Now, James's focus is when times are bad. But that is the nature of this. The whole point of temptation and trial is, as Matthew Henry said, to get us to sin, to make a bad call, to do something unwise even through either weakness because it's so bad that we're, we're hurting or trickery is so good that we fall for it. Because that's what we did in 2000. It was so good we fell for it. And people would say, people are doing some crazy stuff. Okay, all right, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm take out an interest-only loan balloon on where I live and put it in the stock market. But at the time, that was the conventional wisdom because it was so good. Everything was going up so fast, it would never come down again, right? Okay, so we got tricked. But we also make bad decisions when times are bad because we're so weak. We're going through it. You know what? You know what, I just can't, yeah, I can't take it no more. I'm just divorcing you. You know what, I just, I just, you know what, I'm just going to do in this because we're so despondent. So then, so either extreme, bad, bad calls can be made. And so James then is, is exhorting his reader, is bad, but I want you to ask God for wisdom. Hear me, saints, okay? Because so, some of you, right now, it might be bad. Let me, let me just throw a James at you. Please, before you do anything, ask God for wisdom. Please, before you make that call. Please, before you walk out on your husband. Please, before you answer the, the, the ad on the internet for, for a companion. Please, before you go to the porn site. Please, before you go get in that debt. Please, ask God for wisdom. Please, before you hold a grudge forever, please, before you decide not to forgive, please ask God for wisdom. Because he'll give it to you. Generously and without reproach. 
he won't even be mad that you asked. He'll say, I'm so glad you asked. Good, this is so good. Thank you, Lord, for that. So it has been said that nothing reveals who we really are like pressure. Somebody say pressure. Friends, it's the truth. The pressure of when things are good, woo, I just got a million dollars. Where'd they go? I ain't seen them in six months. They got that million. They're done. It's out. They're out. Or bad times. What happened? Something bad. I don't know. I ain't seen them in six months. That's who you are. You can find out who you are at the extreme. You come into an inheritance, do you turn into a jerk, or do you give still? Say, talk to me, somebody. Listen, okay. Hello, CRCC? Somebody gives you a million dollars this week. Let's say you happen to be one of our tithing families, because we don't teach it as a legal thing, but we encourage to 10% as, as, as a model. And all of a sudden now, you get a million dollars. So, y'all doing the math, aren't you? Just look at that math. <laughs> and, you, and you got a million dollars, and you roll up in here next Sunday. Well, you know, you don't teach it as a legal thing, is what I heard. <laughs> you know, I think 10,000 is pretty good. <laughs> Times are good. Making suspect decisions all of a sudden. In the middle of the blessing. I've always been amazed at that. You're blessed. But then you do less. I, I'm amazed. That, well, anyway, that's, that's who we are, right? But then we also, it happens on the other end too where, you know, you lose a million. And you roll back up in here. I ain't giving nobody nothing this week. Somebody need to give me something. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're susceptible to these things. So James, though, is saying, ask God for wisdom. Watch him give it in the middle of whatever it is. Ask God for wisdom. A few verses down, James writes, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. In other words, under trial, you, you don't move. Oh, gosh. Lord, help us today. CRCC, this is so appropriate for this church. I don't even know. I just want to jump up and down and wave like plane flags at y'all. Listen, listen, because this is where we're under trial. We've been under trial. We're going to be under trial. Blessed is the man then who remains. Uh, yeah, it's good. We can be steadfast, or at least most of the time. But when it starts to do this, can you just go? Do that in your marriage. Watch what happens. Look, right now, I'm getting on your nerves. You're getting on my nerves. Guess what? I ain't leaving. <laughs> ah, Jesus! Come on, somebody! Right now, boom! Ah, no, no, no. No, 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 devil. No, no, no. Right now, she's on my nerves. Right now, I'm on her nerves. Right now, we all thinking the grass is greener down the street, but I ain't moving. Blessed is that man who can remain steadfast on this. We're going to see this. This, is what, this was the, the crux of what James was saying. Okay? That's why we need God's wisdom. This is a constant theme in James. To endure in holiness, to persevere and not lose your mind or your integrity. How badly we need wisdom and understanding. How desperately do we need them to cover and protect us during moments of temptation and trial. How Desperately, does everyone in this room need this? So may we heed the Bible and get a little wisdom. I put some Proverbs in here, Old Testament wisdom, and we'll bring you around in James here, but just real fast. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. But your neighbor say, don't be a fool. <laughs> Proverbs 2, 6, the Lord gives wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 3, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and profit, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. The personification of wisdom is what this is. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Oh, get wisdom. 
Get understanding. Proverbs 5, my son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion. Your lips may guard knowledge for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Get wisdom during times of trial and temptation and suffering. Proverbs 8, does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way? At the crossroads, she, crossroads, she takes her stand beside the, beside the gates in the front of the town. At the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud, To you, O oh men, I call, and my cry is to the children of men. O oh, simple ones, learn prudence. O oh, fools, <laughs> Learn sense. It's the Bible. Proverbs 9, wisdom has built her house. She has hewn seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come eat my bread and drink the wine that I've mixed. Leave your simple ways and live. You ever ever just see, you ever remember back in the, was the 70s, 80s, people used to use that word simple a lot more? It's just simple. (laughs) My my, my mother said, simple, don't be simple. (laughs) Been called simple a little bit too. Leave those ways, though, and what? And live. And walk in the way of what? Insight. You know what? Best source of insight in the whole world, right here. Right here it is. Want it? There it is. Don't have to do, you don't have to live the way of the fool, even during suffering. You know, it shouldn't be expected that when times, hard times come, Christians lose their minds. I want to be like those brothers, those 21 brothers you know, who even though there were people standing behind them with, 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 with knives, they wasn't losing it. They wasn't crying out. They wasn't, stop, stop. They were sitting there. I'm about to go be with Jesus in a minute. Lord Jesus, help me. That's how this works. For to him I live and for him I die. That's who we are. We're Christians. We have been saved from sin by the call of the God the Father in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Son, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again on the third day, declaring himself once and for all, I am God, rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father, calling us out of our darkness, setting our feet on the rock that is him, and giving us eternal life in Jesus Christ that begins now, yes, even when the physical body dies, to be absent from the body is to be present. Hallelujah with the Lord. And so he calls his people then out of the world. Ecclesia Church called out ones. We are not to look like, sound like, be like. And says, I'm going to give you my wisdom in the middle of all that suffering. But in the middle, till I come back, you be a light set on a hill that everybody can see. They may not like the light. They may be blinded by the light. But I've left the light in the world for a reason. What a great tragedy when the church is dark and the world is dark, so everything's dark. What a great tragedy that when, instead of holding to Scripture, the, the church lays down so the world is comfortable with us, as opposed to being convicted by the power of God working through us. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom, the discerning sets his face towards wisdom, but the eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. May I encourage you, get your eyes out of the world. Put your, that's the foolish thing. Do the wise thing. Put your eyes on the Lord. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. So here's our thoughts on the, on the text today. We've already kind of done it, but here it is for you. Lessons and takeaways on the assurance of wisdom. Number one, if any of you lacks wisdom, this phrase, the word for wisdom here in Greek is Sophia. Maybe you didn't know that's where that name comes from, wisdom. Sophia in Greek, and it means to be broad and full of intelligence, used of the knowledge. In other words, the right use of knowledge. 
in very diverse matters. And we can see from Proverbs that God wants us wise. And so if any of us lacks wisdom, all we have to do is ask. We've all lacked wisdom at some point, and we all still do in certain areas and situations. This part of the verse, here's your feeling, is a demonstration of grace. He didn't say if only some of you lack wisdom. The Holy Spirit through James writes, if any of you lacks wisdom. And so the great grace is, if you lack wisdom now, guess what you, get? Guess what you can do? You can ask. Lord, I don't know what to do about such and such. Would you show me what to do? Would you show me via your word? Would you, would you give me wisdom to endure this the way that I'm supposed to? So this is a demonstration of grace. It's not only certain people get to be wise. It is any who lack wisdom. It means no special person, no special status, from the lowly to the exalted. All of us can receive wisdom from our Lord, for God shows no partiality. I found that knowing God will grant wisdom is one thing. That's our text today. But I have to exhort you. Actually abiding in the wisdom he grants is quite another. We'll learn this and we'll study this in, in detail. James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word. You know how you, you know another way you can say that? Be doers of the wisdom. Because I dare anybody in this room to say that God's word is not wisdom. Be doers of the wisdom, be doers of the word, and not hearers only, because if you hear but don't do, guess what? You're deceived. No one likes to think of themselves as deceived. Nobody. But when I hear and don't do, I'm walking in deception, and I better face it quickly or it'll just perpetuate. If I fall into a pattern of being a bad husband and Ephesians 5 is going boom, boom, and I mean, in every place I turn, because how many of y'all, God loves you so much, how many of y'all got that relationship with the Lord where you know he loves you, you love him, and he just messes with you when you're off? Anyone, anyone walk in that? Oh, you don't, oh, that's it? Oh, that's not good. <laughs> Let me try it again. Maybe you didn't understand what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit begins to convict you when you're messing up. Okay, whew. See, Jesus, because that's like a mark of being his, right? I mean, you can't, you shouldn't be able to just move and do and say and think and not hit ba-boom, ba-bang, ba-boom. What are you doing? This scripture comes to mind. Somebody calls you right about, I was praying for you. The Lord just told me to call you because you need to do what he said. Right? That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's because he loves us. So truth of the matter is we, we, we become deceived when we do that. And so listen, my point is this. If you're going to ask God for wisdom, and we have an assurance that he's going to grant it, check yourself to make sure that you're willing to do it. Otherwise, you'll fall into patterns of deception. Half of marriage counseling is, is, is undergoing getting folk free from deception. Easily half, easily, when we're talking about two Christians. Because they're saying stuff that's so contrary to the word, and you bring the word to bear on the situation, and it's like, mm, I know it says that, yeah, um, uh, uh, ah, hmm, well, ah, hmm. And, and so you, you, you're just fighting against, I've heard it, I'm not going to do it. I've heard it, I'm not going to do it. And I'm, I'm deceived now, and so you're starting to sound like Charlie Brown's teacher to me. And slow as the counseling session drags on, but the Bible says, rah, 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 rah. And you just finally go, okay, that's it for today. Father, thank you for this couple. We just ask you to bless them in Jesus' name. Because you know there's nothing you can do. Okay, let's not do that. Let's not do that, all right? So if you're going to ask him, let's go, let's go. Let's ask him, but then let's be willing to do what he said. Look at number two. The Bible says in verse five, let him ask God. If you don't have wisdom, ask God. Since God wants us to walk in wisdom, he exhorts us, praise him, to ask how many of us truly want his wisdom? Think about it again. This is an important question because once we have the knowledge, friends, we are. Any guesses on this blank? I'm in number two, the blank of number two. Any, any guesses? Once we have knowledge, we are what for it? Accountable. That's exactly right. We're accountable for it. And that's the way it should be. How many of you parents have said to your children, I told you. Did you hear what I said? What did I tell you? What are you doing? Holding them accountable for what they heard you. It's as it should be. 
That's exactly right. That's the way it must be. Well, it's no different here. Jesus said, if I, not, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse. Why? Because he's spoken. Hebrews write, the writer of Hebrews writes, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's a tough spot. James 4, we'll get here eventually. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is. So, so listen, listen, get that last verse. James 4, we'll get there eventually. But listen, for those, gosh, understand how God works, okay? For those who hear God's word in an area that you don't believe is a sin area, but you've heard God's word, and you choose not to obey God's word that you knew was right for you, there's no way around that. If you know the right thing to do, but then you choose not to do it, even though it may not be an area that's even all that, but you know the right thing to do, but you choose not to do it, then for you now, what you're doing is fighting against God. When God gives, in other words, when God grants us wisdom, Lord, what do I do? Do this, daughter. Do this, son. Do this, church. Do this, country. Do this, team. Do this. And so we walk, we start, remember now, because this is in the same chapter here, chapter one, we begin to walk in deception. It's all tied together. We'll get there, but it's only a few verses down. We'll begin to walk in deception. I just don't want that for you all. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for our children's children. That deception that exists in the church that we can just lollygag based upon what God says, blow it off, and, 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 and then put a big grace on top of it as if we're not deceived. Yeah, grace, he didn't kill us, but we're still deceived. Okay, so let's not do that. Let's ask, let's get this wisdom, and then let's be committed to the very best of our ability to do what he gives us, okay? Let us ask God. Let him ask God. Look at number three. God will give how? Generously. Oh, here's the promise. Here's the great news of today. If you don't know what to do, and your heart is honestly seeking and searching after God and what he wants, he will give it to you and do so generously. You will not have to sit and wonder for too long. God will help you and give you wisdom, particularly in the midst of suffering. God will give generously without reproach. What a great blessing. If we ask, if we truly desire his wisdom, he'll give it, and he'll give it generously. Lest we forget, God still loves to bless his children. Jeremiah 32, I will rejoice in doing them good. I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all of my heart and, and all my soul. John 15, just from last week, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is what our Lord wants. He's our dad. He loves us. Okay, he loves us. So this isn't a bad thing. This is great news. If we ask him, he'll give it to us generously. I'm so encouraged by that because there's some stuff in my life right now where I don't quite know what to do. I'm like, Lord, what do I do? What is your word here? What is your will here? How do I walk in wisdom here? He's going to answer, and he's not mad that we ask, okay? Not only will he give wisdom, but he won't be mad about it because it says he'll, do, he'll give it to us generously and without reproach. It's okay to ask him. He will not correct or rebuke us in the asking. Precious friends, we can go to God for his wisdom in our weakness and our despair, in our stumbling and in our uncertainness, in our confusion and in our pain, and he will answer. Now, whether you like the answer or not is something different, but he will answer. Number four, let him ask in faith with no doubting. Somebody shout, no doubting. Like everything else, God is honored by our faith and our trust in him. Our faith and our trust in him. In Matthew 9, we find this wonderful story of the blind men who came to Christ and they were asked by the Lord, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. It's a wonderful passage where we see the Lord so honored by their faith that he says, by that same faith, be healed. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Paul, stop right there. Everybody check in real quick. Look, how many of you believe that God truly exists? 
Okay. How many believe that he is, he is, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and coming back again? Okay. Now listen, that means we serve the creator of the universe. Here's one of the things that we have to overcome, not just as a local congregation, but as a, as a body of Christ. We have to overcome thinking that he's got it in for us here. That there's, that there's something in, that his commandments are burdensome. We have to overcome that. See, what ought to blow through that in your mind is the awe that you have of serving the God of all creation. We, we believe that he exists, therefore we diligently seek him, and he is honored by that sort of faith. What accompanies that, though, is this great wisdom that begins to set in. We ask him, Lord, show us, and he begins to show us. And as maturing believers, we stop thinking that what he shows us is going to spoil our fun. And, and we parents, we've got to do a better job of this, too. Yes, there are times where we just lay out the commandment, but I, what I want to build in my children, I want, them, I, want them to, I want to build in the fear of the Lord in, in my children. But I also want to build in the awe of the Lord in, in my children. I want them to have a good blend of both because that's what we're supposed to have. I want them to be too fearful to go doing stupid, right? But I also want them to be so overwhelmed by his mercy. They, they begin to look at so so when those times come where we have to wade into those teenager type discussions, say amen, parents that had, who had teenagers. I don't want it to just be don't. Why? Cause I said so. That's good. They should learn that by four and five, right? Six and seven. They got that part right. But now I want what I hope to see is yes, it was because the Lord said so. I said, oh, but daddy, I'm not trying to hurt our, my God like that, because He gave me these restrictions before marriage not to hurt me. Not to spoil me, my fun. Not to ostracize me in the world, even though that's part of this call you taught us, Daddy, to which I'll say, amen, keep going. <laughs> but he gave me these commandments because he loves me. Because this is his plan. Because this is the best way. Because this is the way that leads to his honor and his glory, and I'll accept and walk in that by faith. Oh, if we adults could get that. These commandments aren't meant to hurt you, sister, brother, friend. They're meant to be a blessing to his children. So he gives us restrictions in, in, in single life and, and restrictions in marriage and restrictions in the church, not to hurt us, but because that was his heart for us. And as maturing children, instead of going rrr, rrr, at daddy, we ought to go, thank you. Thank you, dad. Because I would have did it my own way here. May we have that kind of heart when it comes to accepting the Lord's wisdom. And may we not feel like we have to vet God's wisdom against the world. But rather vet the world's so-called wisdom against the word of the Lord. Let him ask without doubt. Oh, Lord, you're going to speak and you're going to show us what you want us to to do. You're going to give us, I'm standing in the context, you're going to give us wisdom. Okay? There's another wonderful little verse there from Matthew Henry. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll read the bold part. It says, a mind that has but one single and prevailing regard to its spiritual and eternal interest, and that keeps steady in, the, in its purposes for God, will grow wise by afflictions, will continue fervent in its devotions, and will be superior to all trials and oppositions. Oh Lord, may that anointing right there rest upon this congregation. Number five, warnings against double-mindedness, and we're done. The word translated double-minded in Greek here is, it's an interesting word, dipsukos. It means wavering, uncertain, or divided in interest. You know, maybe we ought to just repent right there. I mean, you know what I'm saying, Elder? Can we just, right there, because how many of you will recognize that at times you have been divided in interest? And I'm not talking with a calculator, and I'm not talking about your, spread, you know, your financial budget right now. I'm saying that sometimes the world, it competes so well with God that you can honestly say, I was just flat divided. Or your flesh is so successful in an area it keeps you bound for so long. And so this double, when, when we look at this word double-minded, yes, it means unstable, but it also means divided. Yes, I have God, and here's my God lane, 
and I run over here on Sundays. Feel pretty good, feel pretty good. You know, repent, get it all off. And then I'm running hard over here the rest of the week. And I'm going to everything the world goes through, and y'all just going to have to be mad today because I'm feeling like an old holiness preacher today. I, I, I watch all the stuff the world watches. I drink everything they drink, smoke everything they smoke, dress like them. So I'm in no position to actually minister to anyone because I look like a total hypocrite. However, I just check in with my God box on Sunday. Well, wait a minute. I thought God was the box. I thought he was everything. Yeah, he is. And so then my Monday needs to reflect him and my Tuesday and my Wednesday and my Thursday. Because remember, we serve the God of the universe. He doesn't take the rest of the week off. Aren't you glad? Anybody glad for a Thursday blessing? Anybody glad for mercies renewed on Saturday? Okay, then we're his people. Come on, y'all. Come on. The, the world has encroached upon the church so badly. It's, it's, you know, and I, I mean, I've been in it. I mean, it just, it's just amazing the turn that we have to make to get back to something that looks authentically biblical. It really is amazing. I mean, they move, we move. They, they do, we do. They're, the fashions, the, I mean, everything. We just run, 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 run after the latest whatever as opposed to seeking the wisdom of God first. Is everything out there wrong? Not necessarily, but... The point is, seek God's wisdom first. First. What does he say first? Let's get that and then judge everything else by that. And so let's not be double-minded. Let's not be divided in interest. Let's repent of that. I repent, Lord. Anybody want to join me real quick? Just about five seconds. Okay, please forgive me. Because I know I I fall into that where it's just... God just isn't that important right now. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I want to do that. No, no, no. So let's not, let's not be that, that unstable thinker where we're always vacillating between two opinions. Let's, not, let's, not, let's, let's work towards that kind of mental and emotional sanctification where we become steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. We serve the God of the universe. Come on, let's act like it. Let's worship like it. Hallelujah, somebody. We serve the living Christ. He who was and is and is to come. Praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him with the high-sounding cymbals. Praise him, all ye people, at everything that has breath. Praise the name of our God. He's worthy of our worship and worthy of our sacrifice and worthy of our denial of flesh and worthy. Oh, saints, hear me this morning. You you don't have to live a mediocre, half-saved life. Live for him. Ask for his wisdom. You don't have to go home today and be sucked right into the same soft porn on TV you do every Sunday. Come on. We can do this for him. If you, have, if you lack wisdom in that area, guess what? Ask him. And he'll give generously and won't be mad that you asked. <laughs> he'll, bl- in other words, he'll bless you with the grace of wisdom. So that last blank in five was divided. Friends, we, may we not only walk in the grace of joy, which we've discussed the last couple of weeks, but may we walk in this grace of wisdom when times are tough. May we rightly apply then the knowledge that our king has given, even during times of trial. Somebody say that with me. Even, even. during times of trial. Remember, when do we make our worst decisions? When times are really, 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 really good? And when times are really, 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 really bad, that's what, I, that's what I think. I mean, we're just susceptible to so much temptation on the one end and just hurt and pain on the other that we just can make. So, so let's just ask the Lord for, for that stabilizing, wonderful, single-minded wisdom. And I believe he'll give it. I believe he'll help us as a church build something authentically biblical. I believe he'll help us 
with, with our things that we're trying to do in the community or with our conference or in our family lives. He will help us love one another, truly, truly love one another with all of our faults. And raise your hand if you have faults. Keep them up if you still want folk to love you. There it is. Look around. Keep them up. Keep them up. Look around. Look at the, look at the person with the fault beside you who still wants you to love them anyway. I mean, that's the way it is. God comes and he speaks to his people via his word and we say, yes, Lord. And then all of us sinners get to go to try to do the best we can do and love one another in the process. That's what this is. And we grow continually as a result. And so may we excel in this knowledge, this grace of wisdom. May we rightly apply the knowledge that our king has given us. May we be stable in all of our ways and thereby give him great glory even during times of suffering. In Jesus' name, and all the God's people said, Amen.